Hello, and welcome. Thanks for joining this CGAP AgroFin Accelerate webinar on the future of work, remaking rural employment after COVID-19. My name is Jamie Anderson, and I work at CGAP, a think tank on financial inclusion, housed at the World Bank, and lead our work on rural and agricultural life. Great, uh, and, and Jamie, I'm, I, uh, let me go ahead and jump in um, as your co-moderator. So I'm Lisa Schrader, and I lead the AgriFin programs um, at uh, Mercy Corps, funded by the, the Gates Foundation and the MasterCard Foundation. And we're going to have a very lively conversation with a wonderful, highly experienced group of panelists, each with their own important expertise on rural employment and the future of work in the shadow of COVID-19. Our conversation has largely three parts. First, we'll take a close look at insights from AgriFin Accelerate's rural job study and get reactions from practitioners. Then we'll step back and look at the wider picture of rural employment, how other crises can inform a response to COVID, how livelihoods change over time, the role of technology, trying to use a, a systems lens to tie this all together. Then we've reserved time for Q&A. We've excited that so many people have responded to this topic and we're interested in dialing in. And we look forward to all of your contributions as well from your own expertise as we go ahead with this dialogue. Here's the excellent panel joining us for today's discussion. We're really fortunate to be joined by Christabel Makokova from IDO.org, Jenny Ruquette from True Trade, Nathaniel Peterson from Busara, Chandra Kant Piaz from Kroppen, May Hani from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Mikhail Hook from the Rural and Ag Finance Learning Lab, Stuart Collis from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Ben Taylor from Agora Global. Thanks again to everybody for making time to join us. Just a few more points on the organization of this webinar, and then we're over to Lisa. We just have a few slides. Christabel is going to share a short deck, and then the rest of our time together will be in conversation. So please share questions and comments in the chat box as we go and feel free to direct your questions to specific panelists. The chat box is in that right-hand column, sort of toward the bottom, and make sure you choose all participants in the drop-down box. We'll discuss as many of these comments as we can here in the webinar, and we'll answer the other ones we don't get to in a short note. We'll send this out with the link to the recording, the slide deck, and the rural jobs landscape study. Toward the end of the webinar, we'll share a link to a very short feedback form for your reactions and any suggestions. And finally, technology. Hope, hope for the best as far as technology. You all know from connecting to a lot of virtual meetings and webinars that sometimes there's a time lag or a connection problem or any number of things. So if anything comes up, just please be patient and bear with us and we'll work through it. So with all of that said, Lisa, over to you. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, so I'm gonna be leading you through this first section of the webinar um, where we're gonna be focusing on uh, some research that we've recently done in Kenya um, and what it means within our, our current context uh, of COVID. Um, historically, technology revolution has shaped food systems and the scope for agriculture-related job creation. And today, we, we really find ourselves in the midst of a digital revolution that's taking hold, and it's affecting agricultural labor and the demand for different types of, of skill sets. At AgriFin, uh, working with more than 100 uh, technology-driven partners across Africa, we are seeing tech dramatically reduce transaction costs and inputs, financial services, and offtake markets, changing economies of scale, and the demand for labor. With demographic shifts in Africa, youth are going to be central to structural transformation in the future. They're agile, educated, and adaptive. 
and the teched up agriculture world that we're seeing um, is going to require a teched up workforce. So in early 2020, AgriFin commissioned a study to understand the potential for job creation around our tech enabled partners here in Kenya with a focus on youth. And that study charts a pathway to a million new jobs created in the agricultural sector. And then of course, COVID happened uh, just before we were going to make the, the study public. Um, and now, of course, the, the situation is, is, uh, is quite different. The UN says that one in nine people globally right now is suffering from hunger. Millions have lost their jobs. New research from 60 decibels with smallholder farmers here in Kenya uh, that just came out, I think today, uh, notes that 87% uh, of smallholder farmers here in Kenya say their financial situation has worsened due to the Pudetan pandemic. Only 10% of farmers currently have incomes from non-farm income sources compared to 26% last year. And in the last two weeks, over 90% have said that they're hiring less labor than normal, with the result that 60% of farmers expect to be harvesting and selling uh, less food than normal. So in the face of, of all of this change in the pandemic, what is this gonna mean for food systems and for jobs? Uh, returning to our, our study from earlier this year, I'd like to invite Christina Makoka to present uh, the original study that we, we did on, on rural jobs here in Kenya and the landscape for uh, youth employment. Uh, and uh, then, as, as Jamie pointed out, we have a great small first panel of practitioners here close to, uh, close to the action on the ground who can react uh, to that study and what it means now. Um, and what are the challenges and the opportunities that we're facing um, in this era of COVID? Um, after our first uh, panel, really kind of talking about the here and now, uh, we'll transition back to Jamie and to our second panel uh, that's really going to be talking about uh, the future of work moving forward post-pandemic. So, Christabel, let me go ahead and introduce you. Christabel Makoka is a very good a very good colleague and friend, um, and a, a strategist and development expert who's passionate about designing sustainable business models and partnerships that drive solutions reaching underserved populations, including women, youth, and smallholder farmers. Um, she led our work here at AgriFin in Zambia, and together with Elena and the team at Dahlberg, led this research on the potential for rural livelihoods to address youth unemployment challenges here in Kenya and across Africa. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Christabel. Thank you, Lisa, for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. So for the next 10 minutes, I'll just walk you briefly through the qualitative research that Lisa has referred to. And the idea is just to give you a bit of a test as to what's the content that's um, in, the, in the survey as opposed and in the research study, as opposed to going in depth with all of them. So I'll just kind of go through some of the highlights from, from the study, and then we'll share a link to the final um, uh, study itself after the webinar. So Jamie, we can go to the next slide. And um, I think one of the questions that we we're asking ourselves is one, why is this important? And is it still even important now? Um, and I think one of the reasons why this study was important for us is currently it's estimated that about a third of Kenya's population between the ages of 15 and 34 is struggling to find meaningful employment. And right now this, this challenge is further exacerbated by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, primarily because youth who are previously engaged in the gig economy or informal employment have actually lost their source of livelihood. So this was important a year ago, and even right now, it's more important than ever because of the fact that a lot of them have lost their jobs. Um, and, and just to give a sense as to how big this problem is, I'll just skip over two slides to slide four and start looking a little bit at the magnitude. Right now, we're only focusing on Kenya, but obviously the challenge is, um, is, is faced worldwide, wide, wide in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. On slide four, Jamie, um, I think I'll just talk through a few numbers that we sort of um, triangulated from the Kenya Integrated Household Budget Survey, from the National Bureau of Statistics, UN Population Projections, and the Ministry of Agriculture actually has post had um, developed an agriculture sector transformation strategy. And so these four documents really shaped how we thought about the magnitude of the problem. So it's estimated that by 2024, there'll be about 9.6 rural youth in Kenya who will face a very challenging job market. Of this, only about 30% of them are actually farming. 
and about 50% of them are not even earning a meaningful employment from their farming, they're primarily subsist um, subsistence farmers. There's about 5.6 million other youth who are not involved in agriculture at all and are really looking for employment. So when you look at these two numbers together, you're coming up to about an estimate of just 7 million youth who are out of meaningful employment and will need to get meaningful employment over the coming years. And so we thought to, to really look and understand how can agriculture and ag related services meet the demand for additional jobs. So in the next slide, we start to look at who, when we talk about youth, what do we actually mean and what are some of the dispositions that we know about youth that can help us to think about how we innovate for, for um, the unemployment challenge. So we know that youth are perceived to be flexible, energetic, and equipped with relevant digital skills, as well as having the ability to learn quickly. Such attributes then make them really well placed for entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial jobs in the agricultural value chains, things like aggregation, rural agents, and managing logistics. And these informal roles are actually probably where most of rural jobs or job opportunities currently exist. Um, although these attributes actually make youth um, employable and skilled to pursue the entrepreneurship activities that we're referring to, there's a lot of challenges that they're currently facing that make it difficult for them to realize the potential that agriculture and rural livelihoods present um, for, for, youth, for youth employment. So, for example, limited land ownership is a big issue. I think when we're looking at our numbers, um, it's estimated that only about 20 or 22 percent of youth in rural areas actually own the land in which they currently live or farm in. Access to finance has been an issue that we've all talked about, I think, for a really long time. The lack of connections to um, professional institutions, for example, or TVETs make it difficult to upskill youth. And then lastly, they have very limited access to and control over resources, especially when you think about women. Um, typically, they wouldn't own land. They are not necessarily making financial decisions in the households, and this translates to youth as well. The second thing to note is that youth are not a homogeneous group. Um, one of the studies that we did with Dalberg Design was actually to do qualitative research to understand what are some of the um, archetypes of different youth and what does that mean for what kind of activities they might be engaged in. So it is important to note that not all youth necessarily carry the same set of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial attributes. And some of this is driven by education level, um, uh, interest and use of technology, land ownership, are they owning land or do they lease land, ambitions, etc. So for example, one of the persona groups that we identify, the ruthless climbers, they do not necessarily have the skills and education levels to make their aspirations real, but they're motivated. And so they might actually be better suited for employment in areas such as commercial farming and agro-processing where it might not require high, level, high skill levels, but at the same time provides uh, meaningful employment for them. Another group, static planners, these ones prioritize their homes and families and see agriculture primarily as a means of achieving stability for their dependents and therefore very risk averse, adverse. And so when you're thinking about things like financial products, uh, they would be a group that might opt for saving forward towards um, their inputs as opposed to taking credit to pay for inputs. So just starting to understand what the drivers and motivations are for different youth segments becomes really important when you want to design um, for better employment opportunities. So then we wanted to understand what are the types of jobs that currently exist in the agriculture space and what is the ability of this type of job to absorb the huge and meant need that I just talked about. I think as I mentioned earlier, there's about 7 million youth who are currently unemployed and live in rural areas. So one of the points that I think I mentioned earlier was that about 1.4 million youth in Kenya are currently smallholder farmers and or subsistence farmers are not really actually making any money from their farming practices. They're primarily farming to put food on the table. So what if we actually intervened in this sort of segment of youth and then promote farming as a business for subsistence farmers? And a lot of work has been done around looking at ways to bundle products and services that then allow someone to move from subsistence farming to more of an emerging farmer. So things like bundling uh, services like um, access to finance, access to quality inputs, information, and good agricultural practices, all of this geared towards enabling youth to, go, to grow up the ladder and move from subsistence farming. But that still only addresses 1.4 million farmers if we were to reach 100% of them. 
there's a huge bucket of youth who are in the sort of 5.6 million bucket that I referred to earlier who are currently seeking meaningful work. So again, we started looking at the entire ag value chain. What are the different ways that youth can get engaged in? And the numbers um, are at the back of the slide. So you can get access to how we sort of triangulated to, to get to these numbers. But one, there's an ability, there's a potential to really look at uh, the large scale private farms that the government is actually pushing for to push for production and, and create jobs in, in these private farms. The second thing is that the government was actually estimating that about 15% of Kenya land mass is classified as high potential agricultural zones, and not all of that land is currently being used. So there's an opportunity there with the right financial tools to really look at how contract farming again can produce an opportunity to employ, to get youth employed in, in, in these farmlands that I just referred to. Secondly, looking at services across the value chain. Again, as I mentioned earlier, youth are very entrepreneurial. entrepreneurial. There's an opportunity to look at how they can get involved in aggregation and agent services and get in, involved in agriculture without necessarily being involved in the production side of agriculture. Lastly, the, uh, the transformation, agriculture transformation strategy for Kenya is also looking at hubs and how these food processing hubs, for example, can actually create jobs and um, they sort of estimated the number of, of jobs that can be get created through, through, through that. So if you look at the four sort of pathways that I've set, which are currently existing, whether that's promotion as, for, for farming as a business, pushing for more youth who are not currently employed to go into production or um, service offering across the value chain or the agro-processing hubs, we're still far away from reaching the 7 million um, uh, gap that I referred to earlier. So in the next slide, I think Jamie, we can actually skip this slide and go to the to the last slide. And as Lisa mentioned earlier, the AgriFin program is really interested in saying how can we create one million jobs in the next five years. And the way we thought about this, and we just summarized it here briefly, but we go into depth in the report, is there's three things that we need to address. One, you have youth who are currently informed, involved in agriculture but are not realizing. Uh, value from the way they're farming for various reasons, whether it's poor farming techniques or lack of access to finance, for example. Two, you have youth who are really not interested in agriculture. There's a perception that agriculture is not something you do. It's uh, if you only go into agriculture if you cannot get a white collar job. So there's perception issues that we need to address. And then three, there's youth who are interested in agriculture but don't necessarily they have access to capital or access to land. So with those three challenges, uh, there's five different areas of opportunities that AgriFin is looking to pursue. The first one is around really working with partners to promote farming as a business by providing end-to-end -end services for youth. And a good example of that is the work that they're currently doing with Safaricom and Digifarm to really see how you can provide end-to-end -end services. The second one is on building a digital platform to promote youth access to land. So here, when I talk about this, think about how Uber has transformed the, transform the transport industry. I think similarly looking at democratizing uh, access to land rather than pushing for land ownership, can we Uberize the land that I referred to where uh, that's really high potential in, uh, in high potential agriculture zones but youth are not able to access it. Can we create a platform that allows youth to access that land without necessarily pushing for them to own the land or coming up with capital that they require to own the land? Thirdly, when you look at job matching platforms, which have transformed some of the uh, industries in Kenya at the moment, but a lot of these job matching platforms really focus on urban or peri-urban youth. How do we adapt them to then be relevant for agriculture and for rural rural markets? Um, then fourth, some of the partners that we've been working with, such as Arifu and Media, are using entertainment and e-learning platforms to really shift the uh, perception that youth have towards agriculture, as well as use those same platforms to upskill youth. And then lastly, um, through public-private partnerships, there's an opportunity to build connectivity hubs to then serve as centers of ex excellence for rural youth. And we've seen an example of this, for example, in China and how they've really transformed the Chinese rural markets. So in summary, I think there's three things we want to address. One, the youth who currently do not have access to capital but are interested in accessing land, uh, so becoming farmers and getting involved in agriculture. And so looking at how we can democratize access to, to land and using PPPs to really build connectivity hubs. Secondly, using uh, digital platforms and edutainment to shift perceptions that youth have towards agriculture. 
And then lastly, looking at bundling products and services that enable youth to move from subsistence farming into farming that allows them to really make meaningful income for, for themselves and, and, and the people that they do support. So I think my time is up. I'll stop here and hand over to uh, Lisa and Jamie. Christabel, thank you so much. Um, so from, from here, we'd love to get reactions uh, from organizations that are working you know, here on the ground in Kenya. Um, and let me introduce our, our, our first small panel, um, including uh, Jenny Ruppet, who is the CEO of True Trade, responsible for the development of a social enterprise that integrates smallholder farmers into sustainable supply chains. She's a leader in food systems thinking with a wealth of experience in inclusive business, rural livelihoods, and ag tech innovation, working across Africa, Asia, and South America. And then we will also be joined by Nate Peterson, who's a decision-making researcher serving as the vice president at Busara, where he develops partnerships and learning agendas with major funders and NGOs. He's interested in how people perceive and manage risk, sustainable agriculture, and digitizing MSMEs. And then our last panelist is Chandra Kamp PS. Uh, Chandra is responsible for heading business operations in Africa and the Middle East for CropIn. Uh, Ch uh, Chandra works to empower these markets with solutions for digitization, predictability, traceability, and sustainability. With CropIn, he's on a mission at the intersection of agriculture, technology, and data science, working to make a difference in the ag space. So I'd like to ask all of you, maybe starting with Jenny, just to you know, react uh, to this study, which was done pre-COVID, um, and what you see right now as the real opportunities uh, and challenges that, that you're facing in your organizations moving ahead. Thanks, Lisa, for the opportunity to kick this off. Um, so True Trade, we're a social enterprise. We're on the ground creating rural job opportunities for you as agents. So it really is an example of um, what was identified in the study as a pathway around that value added agricultural services. So the youth provide our market connect service for farmers. They use our IT to manage aggregation, to register farmers and trigger payments. So I'm reflecting on the study, I mean, I think the key point is around scale you know the figures really highlight the challenge that's there and you know, over recent years we've seen huge amounts of um, exciting innovation in the ag tech space and the pandemic is really making it increasingly important that we digitize supply chains and digitize solutions that um, that can provide opportunities for farmers in, um, and, and youth in agriculture and in value chain services. Um, and youth have this you know, unique opportunity because you've got the tech savviness, so how you combine the IT piece with that role as a human touch point. But we really need to look at how can we get scale and that ties to the second point about risk. I mean, working on the ground now um, our agents would be considered informal. They have a commission-based revenue stream. And what we've seen in the pandemic, I mean, we're considered an essential service provider, and we've managed to maintain supply chains and get farmers produce to market. But we've seen escalating logistics costs. We've also seen that um, the buyer prices have significantly dropped. So there's certainly that perception of um, supply being higher than, it's not just the overall demand, but the effective demand. And that's really um, put a squeeze on, um, on the viability and therefore on the revenue opportunity for, for youth um, for, as, as agents. And I think it's that uncertainty around revenue that um, is, is a big issue that's then affecting capacity to get to scale. And another point on gender, um, because we're very much seeing that women as agents, um, there's a significant gender divide. I mean, I, I don't mind sharing that 20% of our agents are women. And we've been really trying to address that gap. Um, but there are a lot of 
barriers and I, th I think we really as a community need to work systematically um, to see how we can enable more um, female youth to be able to make the most of these opportunities in both the more formal and informal employment. Um, so those were just some key reflections um, to kick us off. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm going to ask Nate to go next. I think he has been uh, leading some research that that, um, that aligns well with the true trade experience. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to your point, you know, Basara really comes at this from trying to understand uh, the decision making process, both of farmers um, thinking about them both kind of as investors and as as labor uh, providers, um, as well as you know, people who are who are absorbing the the labor supply that we see in excess right now, um, and you know, so right now I think it's important to note that there's a really difficult decision making context, both for for farmers, as well as for kind of labor who you know may not have the the resources, land, things like that to actually go into primary production or scale. So right now we know that. You know, in, in urban areas, especially for cost of living management reasons, people may have lost jobs and they're thinking about, you know, going back to rural, whether to kind of farm their own land, which they might not have the cash for inputs, um, or if, if they're upcountry looking for, you know, some, some other sort of uh, labor opportunity. Um, but, you know, as, as you mentioned from the 60 decibel study originally at, at the kickoff of this, um, you know, a lot, many fewer farmers are actually hiring labor. And so, you know, if they can't afford inputs, they're not sure what labor is. It's it's a huge source of uncertainty. And combined with that, you know, we've we've been running some market studies, um, you know, even in Nairobi City County, in Kiambu, in Nakuru, and we're seeing, you know, a huge amount of price uncertainty. So, you know, we're certainly seeing, you know, prices for farmers often going down. There's a lot of middlemen activity. People are taking advantage of this uncertainty and offering unfair prices often. And um, so, so people are in this really, really dynamic environment, which makes farmers much more uncertain about whether they should be spending money on, on input and labor. And the, the indicators we do have that could conceivably be, a, be available, prices are really dynamic and hard to kind of wrap our arms around an aggregate. And, you know, if we're looking at input sales and things like that, a lot of times, you know, actually getting that information together, um, especially when it's non-digital non is really difficult. And so the, the, the information we need to help stabilize these markets isn't there. And so when people have, you know, farmers have reduced income, and they get a bit more myopic in investment we see. You know, I think this the same 60 decibel study mentioned that many farmers are are reducing um, input purchases, but also taking big steps like selling, selling major assets and livestock, um, accepting lower prices. And so all of this stress, you know, combines um, to, you know, look, leave them looking for what should they do Right, and when people are are completely uncertain, you know, typically the safest thing to do, especially in rural communities, is to to you know try to react, look to what your neighbors are doing, and the funny thing is that when we when we see this happen, which is really common in, in a number of studies that Bosar has run across the last year, but especially more acutely in the time of COVID, is that they're really just you know looking for what the community is doing, and creating these these pretty major herd effects where you'll see um, you know, the uh, well, chicken farmers massively scaling down production and then realizing there's you know, a, a price increase because of lack of supply and then everyone chases that again. And so we're seeing these, these things kind of jumping up and down, which makes it difficult to say what the exact you know, reaction of the market is to COVID. And so how can we reduce uncertainty? I think is the, the question because we know we need it for farmers to feel stable in investments and for our, our agriculture markets to grow and to absorb, you know, this labor that may be coming out of urban areas. Um, and the, the answer is that we need to give them information. And we know that information typically makes people feel confident, but not just as a pure piece of information. They want to know that they understand the full scope of the information that could be available. And this is why these digitized uh, supply chain um, mechanisms and, and companies like True Trade are really valuable. You know, other types of agricultural platforms because people can access so many different types of information at once. It actually gives them true confidence that they're understanding the market in some fundamental way that would allow them to react in a way that's not just kind of 
confident, but hopefully, hopefully more accurate that they, they know they're getting fair prices. They know they're going to have access to, to off takers and markets afterwards. And so, um, I, yeah, I really think that, that thinking about this from farmers risk perception, um, because they're going to be the ones that are, are really driving our ability to absorb the excess, excess urban labor right now is, is critical. So continuing research on these platforms, you know, things are dynamic and there's not really an end to it that I can see. Nate, thanks so much. Uh, that's really, really helpful. You know, um, our COVID response at AgriSyn is, is now reaching almost 8 million farmers with messaging. And um, a recent study that we did with WeFarm showed that, you know, a, a huge number, just 90% of, of farmers were saying more information, please, more information, please. As you said, there's a um, you know they're trying to uh, avoid a lot of uh, a lot of myths. They, a lot of them believe COVID is, is transferable from their domestic pets to their livestock. It's, you know they're they're operating in such an, an environment that is information challenged um, and trying to make decisions. So I think that what we're seeing is the immediate real relevance of, of digital channels to get information out, but also, as you said, um, you know for true trade to and organizations like True Trade, you know, to help farmers walk every step of the journey to, to get to production. Um, and to that, uh, in that model, we'd I'd like to introduce uh, Chandra from Cropin, who has kind of amazed us uh, by developing an agile solution for ag extension workers and field force in Ethiopia in the middle of COVID that's still moving in COVID. And, uh, and, and we'd love to hear uh, to hear Chandra's uh, thoughts about this, this, this opportunity and risk environment that we find ourselves at this time of COVID. Sure. Go ahead, Thank Chandra. you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for the introduction and hosting this. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Uh, so I would like to continue the discussion what everyone brought about, uh, but telling in story way, uh, I would like to show how digital technology uh, can change the livelihood, uh, empower uh, youth and also women across the world, right? So let me take a simple example where we have uh, done a project with, uh, with an organization known as Tata Trust. Uh, so this is a philanthropic organization in India. Uh, they had this mission to create smart villages, right? And these smart villages uh, were, were aimed to bring out 100,000 uh, households out of poverty irreversibly. Uh, so irreversibly meaning they just want to increase the quality of life and quality of charges of life as well. So how do we do that, right? So we just began in terms of uh, providing uh, uh, your capacity building to these farmers uh, in these remote locations in India. So these farmers were trained to global standards. These farmers were not aware of the markets. Uh, they were not provided with the right seeds, chemicals, or even advised services. So it could be to the adverse effects of your weather. It could be your pests and diseases and everything else, right? So digital platforms like us and other players in the market help these farmers in these rural villages and rural districts uh, to uplift their own whole life and livelihood. By the way, in terms of providing right advisory stand to them in terms of how to grow their crops, uh, rightly advise services to the weather, right access to finance, uh, and also the right access to the market, right? So this enables the society and livelihoods in a rural, rural area and in India, uh, enabling the farmers to grow better and increase their livelihoods. So we successfully helped, uh, or we as an organization helped uh, the to 40,000 bags out of poverty, and this is scaling up as we move ahead and as we discuss. Uh, the second example, which I also want to tell you across, is the how the partnership with our phone in in a, in a country where uh, we created women entrepreneurs or women agripreneurs itself uh, in terms of gender equality. Uh, these women entrepreneurs and agripreneurs were created uh, where they were provided with smartphones and a solution to help a group of farmers under them. So these group of farmers were provided with the right package of practices. Uh, they were provided with the right ways to grow their crops. Uh, they were provided with the right timely advisory services. It could be through weather, your pests and diseases, and everything else. And eventually, when you when you do all this right, this enables the farmers to grow better. The farmer grows better, he has a better harvest, and when he has a better harvest, it gets a better price in the market. So when the farmer makes this and gets a better price, this woman as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur uh, himself or herself becomes much more sustainable and also becomes and comes out of poverty line. So that's how digital technology is changing life uh, across the world. But lastly, I just want to mention about how youth 
uh, which which uh, which is the focus of this discussion as well is how youth is right now is the largest generation in human history, right? Uh, we believe that there are close to uh, half of the world's population under the age of 30. But how do you align them towards uh, towards this agriculture? Uh, we have been uh, we have been looking different parts of organizations and people across Africa and other parts of the world as well. Uh, the the three major things what I believe as personally is that uh, the three things what we have to do uh, to the folks of people across the world is number one, we have to change the perception. As Christabel rightly mentioned, we need to change the perception in terms of what agriculture is, right? We need to show that this is a lucrative business to be in, this is a lucrative career path to be in, right? So if you change the perception by, by communicating to them through ICT tools or through your radios and television saying that, hey, agriculture is a nice place to be in. So this perception will eventually enable you to go towards uh, to go towards agriculture and also make a livelihood and living out of it, right? So that's number one. Number two is also I want to bring out the point in saying that the agriculture farming has to be imbibed in youth in a very, very early stage, right? So, for example, I didn't know how to grow a tomato or a potato way back in when I was in schooling or my colleges, right? So probably I'm learning now. Uh, but yeah, when when you know and when you get it imbibed at an early age, this allows you to be focused on the path of the passion what they follow, and also creates a employment in the agriculture sector as well, right? So not only creates employment but also solves a lot of problems. You like your uh, food safety, food security, and also creates employment for youth and other folks in different parts of the world. So the last part which I want to highlight and mention is how do you make it interesting, right? Uh, people want to come into agriculture, but they don't see that this is profitable, it's not money making and everything else, right? But digital technologies, ICTs are modernizing in terms of way how agriculture has been performed right now, right? Uh, you have precision agriculture, you have satellite images, you have drones, you have your other ways in terms of how agriculture is becoming the next big thing. So these ways, when you when you get in technology, when you get digital world into the agriculture sectors, uh, this enables and supports farmers not only to attract you to the you to the agriculture sectors uh, where they have much more higher productivity using digital tools and uh, uh, appliances, uh, getting higher productivity and higher income as well. So these are three things which I wanted to highlight in terms of how ICTs and digital technology increases productivity, increases money into the sector of your agriculture and in and and enrolls more youth uh, towards the agriculture sector. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Chandra. Okay, so I'll go ahead and wrap up this panel just just highlighting that you know we're really seeing an opportunity uh, in a time of COVID to scale digital solutions. Um, they're what works. I mean, they they are replacing uh, you know the 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 mobile field force and and enhancing what they do and technology. Uh, you know, is is allowing us to reach very large numbers of of people with information, but but we do need to mind the you know the digital divide um, and make sure that this is equitable, that this is available for women and and available for for youth. And you know, beyond just information, we've got to be supporting farmers, uh, you know, with you know the full suite of services they need to get to markets effectively. So opportunity, challenge, um, and interesting ideas for future of work. Uh, with that, I, I would really like to thank uh, Christabel for the presentation and Jenny, Nate, and Chandra uh, for your insights here. Um, the full panel will be joining uh, the Q&A session at the, at the end of our next panel. And with that, uh, I'll go ahead and hand over to Jenny. Thanks, Lisa. Fascinating discussion and a great grounding for the second part of our conversation. Let's build on these insights from Kenya and open the aperture, step back to take in a wider geography, longer time scale, and consider how rural employment and livelihoods might change over time inside these very complex, rapidly changing systems that surround them. And why the focus on employment here? Why is that important? It's about more than just having a job. Of course, a job generates income, but also learning. A workplace brings different people together. Jobs can be an important means of personal agency and social inclusion, can contribute to social stability. Employment is about more than just that job. And COVID-19 has changed that conversation about employment, especially in food systems. It's exposed the vulnerabilities of the current system and accelerated the importance of technology. 
which we've already spoken of. And of course, this includes some people, but it can exclude and further marginalize others, particularly women, people living in poverty, people in rural areas. The pandemic sparked this dialogue about how to approach the coming period of recovery and rebuilding, reorganization in food systems, which are at the heart of rural employment. And our stated intent is always not just to reestablish the flawed systems that were there before. We're asking how can food systems be more resilient? And what's that, what's that mean for the people in those systems? How are more equitable, just food systems negotiated between producers and consumers, employers and the employed on and off farms? And what does that mean for the future of work and employment in rural areas? These are the big questions we're tackling in this part of our conversation, and each of our four panelists will approach them from different angles, drawing on their own unique expertise. A reminder to share your comments and questions in the chat box. We, we've got both the Q&A box and the chat box going, so please drop those in there. We want to hear from, from your expertise as well. And let's open the conversation with May Han. May joins us from FAO, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. She's a policy officer in rural institutions and services and leads FAO's work on access to rural services and markets for reducing rural poverty. Her own work focuses on policy and institutional development within pluralistic service systems to promote market orientation for small scale farmers. May, thanks for making time to join us. We're so glad to have you in this conversation because of your work on other crises like Ebola and the food price crisis in 2008. And now as we're facing COVID-19, there's a deep interest in learning from these past crises to inform our response to the current one and think ahead to those larger implications for rural employment. So from your experience, what insights from past crises do you see as particularly relevant to what we're going through today and where we go from here? Okay, thank you very much, Jamie. Well, I would like to start by a question, like what do we find in common between the different prices? The Ebola, which was very much localized geographically, the uh, uh, food price uh, crisis of the 2008, which was a, a completely different perspective, did not have the health uh, issue. I would say that one aspect is clearly common to all prices is that it really tends Prices tend to reveal the gaps and weaknesses in any system and hit the most vulnerable hardest. And this is what we're seeing in the food and agriculture sector is that the, the small scale producers that make up more than 80% of, uh, uh, of, uh, food of farmers and food producers uh, globally are the ones hit hardest. Uh, the rural poor woman youth, the informal workers uh, in rural areas, all those are the ones experiencing the, uh, the impact of the pandemic in, in really uh, uh, profound uh, ways. So I would look at the, at the small scale producers and see how they're really impacted and also in what ways this has been also the, the case in, uh, in the Ebola uh, epidemic and also what lessons we can learn from that and from the food crisis as well in mitigating the impact and looking for the uh, diverse measures and options that can mitigate that, uh, uh, that impact. So we see that small scale farmers and rural producers are experiencing a severe loss of income and productive uh, capacity as a result of the uh, temporary restrictions on movement which are hindering market access. This has been also the case with the Ebola uh, uh, epidemic in 2014, changes in consumer behavior and lower demand due to closure of schools, uh, farmer markets, restaurants and other pu public spaces. This was also the case um, in both the food crisis of 2008 and also the Ebola crisis in 2014. As we see with loss of income and times of uncertainty, consumers tend to limit consumption more to staple or to the most essential and uh, uh, tend to, to uh, uh, 
limit their consumption of more diverse fruits, vegetables, uh, and other perishable products like uh, uh, like uh, uh, dairy products, uh, aquatic products, and the like. And this is exactly what we're seeing in this in this uh, uh, current pandemic: is that uh, small-scale farmers are experiencing huge losses due to that. Uh, because of the uh, reduction in consumption of perishables, leading to to uh, crop losses and also uh, 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 loss of income uh, in many cases, which also calls for for very well targeted measures to to uh, uh, to absorb the surplus to uh, through public purchases and also through different support mechanisms that uh, uh, that can. Uh, channel the surplus product uh, or crops to those who are more vulnerable and in, uh, food insecure families. Uh, the third measure that we see, or the third challenge that we see, is that the dis disruption to production due to shortages of uh, seasonal workers, migrant laborers, for example, but also due to difficulties in, uh, in working on the field in, in groups and the need for physical distancing, that is also limiting the capacity of, of uh, uh, producers to uh, uh, to reach their their farms. This was also the case in uh, in the Ebola crisis, and we learned from there the the, the importance of developing the right uh, communic health communication measures and making it accessible to farmers and uh, rural workers uh, in different uh, along the value chain also to the different actors on the value chain, uh, making sure that uh, that uh, this health communication and also the, the uh, personal protective ex equipment is available and accessible to the, uh, to the small scale farmers. Uh, uh, other issues relate to value chain disruptions um, as a result of several points of the, of the above, creating both financial challenges and also constraining access of the uh, small-scale farmers to necessary services, uh, inputs, and uh, also appropriate technologies and operational material. Uh, this was also the same with the, with the uh, Ebola crisis. And there, we, from learning from there, we see that uh, uh, certain policies, integrated policies, were put in place to address those. Uh, uh, the, um, including issuance of uh, vouchers, um, a colleague mentioned bundled services, vouchers for uh, purchasing inputs, but also for purchasing services. And this is one, uh, one important issue is the, the limitation of uh, uh, availability and, and access to, uh, to different forms of agri-services from advisory to technical to pest control, input supply and other. Which also uh, calls on on the uh, uh, brings uh, awareness to the need for the diverse actors and service provision along the value chain, and not only limiting to to the, uh, our response measures to to the public sector, but really looking at also those who are spread in rural areas, the producer organizations, different top forms of rural institutions, as well as the uh, uh, as the private sector uh, that are service providers in their own right. And here, I, I really note that uh, uh, we've all been experiencing this uh, huge shift, very fast shift to, to digital technologies in everything that we do, from communicating with family to purchasing our essential needs uh, and all the way through the, uh, the whole spectrum, which makes uh, digitalization, the word of the day. But with this, I'm, I'm happy that uh, Jamie mentioned the issue of equality. We really need to make sure that building back does not mean increasing this shift to digitalization, does not mean increasing inequality and increased marginalization for those who are more vulnerable, especially, for example, women that have tend to have higher Literacy, uh, literacy rate and higher digital illiteracy and less access to the technologies. So how can we make sure that this shift to digitalization, e-commerce to overcome all those constraints are 
equally benefiting the small scale farmers and those who need that, uh, those technologies most. And one uh, area that FAO is emphasizing is, uh, and we've seen Good. evidence of this in, uh, uh, in different response measures promoted by, by local community organizations, is the need to strengthen farmers' organizations and ability of those rural institutions, different forms of rural institutions, ability of producer organizations to bridge that illiteracy gap, bridge that digital gap, and also make sure that those technologies are accessible to those who need them. Hello. Hi, May. Hi, May. I think we might have lost Jamie. Um, so why don't I go ahead and step in for her um, and, and introduce our next uh, our next speaker, our next panelist, uh, Michael Hook, uh, who's the director of the Rural and Agricultural uh, Finance Learning Lab. Uh, Michael, do you want to go next? Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, glad to join this discussion. I wonder where Jamie disappeared, but I'm sure she'll reconnect. Um, yeah, so as, as some of you may know, uh, Raffle produces a lot of research. Um, one of the things we've been working on this year since COVID hit is a series of COVID emergency briefs that look at the impact of this crisis on different types of rural households and businesses. Um, you guys can find that research on our website, which I think we'll share in the Slack channel eventually, or sorry, in the, in the chat channel. We're also implementing a longer term uh, client pathway deep dive study that's really trying to understand how rural households transition across different development pathways and what products and services can help them improve their livelihoods as they make these transitions. And finally, our close partner, the Fund for Rural Prosperity, is also getting ready to publish a really interesting paper that looks at different pathways and mechanisms through which their fund participants are creating jobs as a result of extending financial services to rural communities. We'll make sure to share these links um, later on uh, in the follow-up email so you can access them. So there's several key insights coming out of this work that uh, are relevant to this discussion. The first is that young people, especially young women, are particularly vulnerable to losing their jobs during this crisis. The study that Lisa and the Mercy Corps team has presented talks, does a pretty good job talking about the challenges that young people face, but young women you know, are especially vulnerable. And so occupational segregation and lower education levels mean that women are often overrepresented in more vulnerable and low paying and less formal forms of employment. So when businesses face economic pressure like they are right now under COVID, these young women are typically the first people to be let go. Women's labor force participation is also shaped by domestic and caregiving responsibilities. And this is even more so the case in emerging economies. In times of crisis, this is amplified and women are often forced by partners or by economic circumstance to give up paid work to care for their children, the elderly, or sick relatives at home. So what this sort of key sort of emerging insight for us means is that we really need to differentiate between young men and women and then design specific interventions that address the unique challenges that they both face. The second insight that is starting to emerge is that people's aspirations and motivations play a really important role in how households make livelihood decisions. So this client pathway deep dive study that we're implementing, it's still in its early days and it's only starting to produce some initial insights. But what we're starting to see is that many of these households do actually not aspire to run their farm as a business or become an entrepreneur. There are many that do, but many don't view it as a, as a, as a livelihood choice, but rather something they're kind of forced to do. So providing, the, providing these households with digital tools and financial and non-financial services, it might improve their livelihoods by boosting you know, quality and quantity of outputs from their farm, but on its own, it's not really going to create a strong, flourishing rural economy that can create large numbers of jobs to meet the gaps that, that Lisa and her team has talked about. So again, what this means for us is that we, re we need to take a more systems-oriented approach to really think about how we can create more formal job opportunities in these rural communities. And then the third, the third insight that I want to talk about is is that we're seeing more and more that agribusinesses that operate in rural communities and offer a combination of both financial and non-financial services to farmers appear to have really strong job creation potential, both direct and indirect jobs. Now, this could be because ag production, which is their sort of core business, 
incentivizes them to provide financial services, but also non-financial services, such as access to training, markets, or ag inputs. And what a lot of research is showing is that when you combine financial and non-financial services, they're much more likely to stimulate the creation of work opportunities. Another, re another reason might be that the simple presence of these agribusinesses in the rural communities also creates demand for other services and opportunities to set up supporting businesses along the value chain. A good example um, that comes from an organization that we work quite closely with is, is Ibero Uganda. Uh, they are a, they're a fund for a rural prosperity participant, and they work with coffee farmers and offer a holistic package of services that includes you know, inputs, credit, training, cash advances, and, and of course, off-taking. Now, what's interesting is that these cash advances can be used for anything, even off-farm purchases. And we've seen that many of the farmers are actually using these advances to start side businesses, like buying a boda, for instance, to provide transportation services in the community. Another interesting thing that Ibero did recently was set up several washing stations in the local community. And then they've hired young people specifically to run these stations. Uh, so what this has done is created new jobs, and it's also increased women's involvement in marketing coffee, as, you know, basically since the point of sale is now closer to their homes and it's not in the urban sort of centers. So if you look at Ibero, you can see that their core business activities and their investments in these washing stations in the rural communities has increased farmer yields as well as their income, but also generated new jobs, all of which uh, contribute to a stronger rural economy. So just looking to the future a bit, uh, you know, we think COVID may trigger a movement towards shortening of supply chains, which may lead to greater regionalization of markets in Africa, with more and more sort of local value-added processing and greater local trade and consumption. You could, you could also imagine a scenario where, you know, more densely populated urban areas become less attractive as places to live and work, especially when you have a, you know, like a pandemic hits and the risk of getting sick or losing your job is higher. So in a scenario like this, you know, a scenario like this could really drive more people back to the rural areas and increase the pressure on these rural economies and job markets. But if you think about this, it also presents an opportunity to build back better and invest in creating, you know, stronger, more vibrant rural economies where many of these new jobs could be created. This is not a small undertaking uh, and, and lots of things need to be in place. You know, we need, we need more investments in rural infrastructure, such as roads, clean water, energy, mobile infrastructure, as well as investments in schooling, and vocational training centers. We also need to continue investing in and supporting these agribusinesses that are working in these rural communities. These, these businesses can actually serve as anchor clients for other businesses that operate along the value chain, such as processing, cold storage, and transportation. These agribusinesses, especially the mid-sized ones, you know, that are too large to access credit from an MFI, but at the same time too small to access loans from commercial banks, need, you know, are especially in need of support. And when you look at what they need, um, it's, it's a range of things. It's access to capital so they can invest in growing their business. It's support in digitizing their operations. You know, we've been talking about how important digital is. And for these businesses to go digital is, is key, especially during a, during a crisis like COVID. It's, they need help in developing policies that can support decent and safe work environments uh, for young people and women. And they need you know, support in, in sort of developing better systems that will really allow them to scale. So I'll stop there. Those are kind of some of the key insights coming, key insights coming from our research and our, the work of our partners, and some thoughts on where we could go in the future. So I'll hand it over to you, Lisa or Jamie. <laughs> Let's see if this works on my side. If you can hear me, then I'll keep. We going. can hear you, Jamie. Yeah, we can hear you now. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. See, this is why I made the mention about technology up front, because somehow I knew that I would be implicated in a, in a technical glitch. But I did hear most of what you said, Michael, and, and I really appreciated that contribution. And now we're going to turn to you, Stuart, for another angle on rural employment and the future of work. Stuart's the Senior Program Officer for Digital Agriculture Solutions at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He focuses on digital farmer services, smart farming, and digital agricultural ecosystems across Africa and South Asia. Stuart, thanks a lot for taking the time to join this conversation and share your views and your very unique perspective. We'd like you to take us up to a higher level picture of technology and agriculture. How do you think about digital farmer services and how these systems can impact rural economies? 
Sure. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, thanks for having me as part of this fantastic panel. Um, and don't worry about the tech. We're all learning how to use technology in better ways uh, through this crisis. So I think that's uh, ubiquitous across the world. Um, yeah, just thinking about uh, a, a broader view, and maybe I'll just start with um, how we think about uh, our strategy here at the foundation and the agriculture team, uh, which is really built around inclusive country-led agricultural transformation. Uh, and while you know COVID-19 is definitely magnifying some of the systemic problems in our food systems, you know we do have these underlying trends uh, and drivers uh, that we look at. Um, so if we think about inclusive agricultural transformation, you know we focus on that. You know, focus on productivity-led growth in smallholder sector because um, you know that drives rural sector economic growth and and has been shown to. Uh, you know, have positive impacts on, on reducing poverty. Uh, so our headline goals are around you know, increasing agricultural productivity, productivity for small scale producers, uh, increasing uh, small scale producer household incomes, improving nutrition and increasing women's empowerment in agriculture. And you know, when we when we talk about structural transformation, as many of you know, it's you know two things. It's shifting GDP out of agriculture, out of the agri sector into other sectors uh, is one aspect of it. And then the other aspect is shifting employment uh, from agriculture into those uh, non-agricultural enterprises. You, when we look at the trends and compare Sub-Saharan Africa to Asia, we do see these trends, so you know, we're seeing that shift. Uh, we're seeing you know, productivity and GDP and employment shifting. It's still the major, you know, agriculture is still the major employer compared to other sectors, but we do see those, those shifts happening, but they're not happening at the same rates as say perhaps they've happened in uh, South Asia and East Asia. Um, it's uh, you know we have labor force is growing um, in in sub-Saharan Africa at twice the rate as it is in in Asia, so that's why we see you know uh, increased uh, availability of labor uh, and unemployment. Um, we're seeing uh, you know I think the estimate for 2020 was that there would be uh, you know an increase compared to 2005 of over 200 million additional uh, working age people. And the median age is 18, you know, seven years younger than the median Asian Asia. So, and I think this just, you know, sort of gives you a broader view of what's happening in Kenya uh, is, is, you know, part of a broader trend. Now, pivoting a little bit to digital, uh, we also see some pretty interesting trends in digital. You know, we, we've seen a lot of, um, you know, a lot of new advancements. You know, we, we always hear about AI and machine learning and, you know, computer vision, drones, satellite imagery, sensors. Um, so we're seeing the costs come down in these sorts of technologies, the ability to scale them uh, beca becoming increasingly available to us. And in agriculture specifically, we're seeing a lot more investment in that space. Uh, although most of that investment has happened in high income countries for commercial agriculture applications. So you know, we definitely see digital has a huge uh, potential in the space. Uh, and we look at it as not a panacea, of course, but as a way to accelerate agricultural transformation. Um, it, it enables us to scale in ways we couldn't, to reach people we couldn't before. It's it's sort of overall a way to improve the efficiencies of food systems on productivity incomes and, and allows us to empower women in new ways. So within our group at the at the foundation, I work with the digital pharma services team and and I focus specifically on smart farming. So that's about you know how do we think about digital tools and technology in support of small scale producers. And you know, we, we definitely think a lot about who are those small scale producers. So you know, it's been some great work done you know, by uh, you know, various groups, uh, EPAR and ISF advisors, AGRA, others on you know, 
as you did with the labor market, breaking down who exactly are the small scale producers we're talking about, you know, whether they're you know, subsistence, uh, pre-commercial, small commercial um, producers. And this is really important because you know, as we design these digital solutions, we need to be thinking about human centered design. You know, uh, how do we design specifically for youth? How do we design specifically for women and the challenges that they face? Um, so, you know, building on the trends that came out of the report that Christabel presented, you know, if we see a more youthful agricultural workforce, you know, we see opportunities in service provision uh, for you know, agripreneurs and others, you know, as part of that service market. And we see benefits to women's empowerment, yet we still see big gaps. You know, there's uh, GSMA reports show the, the significant gaps in, in digital, especially around some of the barriers being literacy, digital skills, and affordability. So we think about you know those barriers and how do we address them. So just uh, you know examples of our investments would be the work we're doing with Lisa's team and Mercy Corps, you know on engagement and bundled services. Uh, we also look at things like you know voice technology and you know where is that headed in terms of addressing some of the digital skills and literacy challenges. And we also think about some of the Digital ag platforms, um, you know, we, you know, such as um, you know, Digifarm and and then government-led platforms, and how do we scale that ag data ecosystem required to drive digital farmer services to scale? Uh, so, just in in summary, I think you know, uh, as I said, it's you know, digital is a way to accelerate agricultural transformation, uh, contributing to that economic growth that we're seeking, uh, that we all seek. Um, it has an impact on rural economies, and we need to consider what, what is the makeup of those rural economies in the next five to 10 to 15 years. Um, you know, it's not just the on-farm components, it's you know, farming as a business, it's the sort of rural enterprises around that farm as well that we're thinking about in terms of digital. Um, how do we you know, enable those agripreneurs and you know, what sort of creative ways can we use all those amazing new technologies? So Christabel mentioned you know, the Uberization of land access, which is an example of just using a two-sided market system with you know, a digital system being the, uh, the, the intermediary there. Um, and then designing specifically for small scale producer economies. As I said, most of the investment in ag tech has been around high income country applications. Uh, so how do we think more about designing specifically for small scale producer systems? And so um, I think you know we've seen in recent times uh, again just the the impact of COVID has really exposed a lot of the challenges we have with the food system, but it also demonstrates where digital can play a role, uh, whether it's for this you know right. this immediate issue or or beyond that. So you know rapid price information tools right. like Nate mentioned. Um, but uh, yeah, final comment uh, then, Jamie, and I'll, I'll finish. Um, is Thanks. you know I, I think uh, besides you know COVID, those underlying drivers still need to be addressed. You know around resilience and the ability to adapt to these types of shocks. So if we think about climate and pest disease shocks as well, uh, beyond the COVID nineteen shocks we're seeing. Thank you. Yeah, excellent, excellent point, bringing climate into the conversation as well, Stuart. Thanks a lot. Okay, Ben, let's bring you into the conversation, and then we'll go into the Q&A. Ben, you bring a critical expertise to, to add to this dialogue, and we're really glad to have you with us, too. Ben's the CEO of Agora Global, a leading social enterprise that delivers technical advice and training to funders and implementers on market systems development. Ben's an expert in systemic approaches to development and can guide us on synthesizing these various angles on rural employment using a market system lens. So Ben, what's your reaction to the conversation so far? How can we use a market systems lens to begin tying all this together? Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot to synthesize here um, over, over the last hour or so. Um, yeah, I think uh, a good way to approach it is, is to look at the, firstly, the underlying systems, um, and that is a, a very overused term, but we adopt a kind of e institutional economics perspective on understanding how outcomes are delivered to, to poor and, and disadvantaged people. Um, and in the context of rural work, that 
tends to mean one of three things. The first is own account production. And as an external actor, you need to help ensure that people who are producing can produce more, produce better, get higher prices for what they do. It can also mean um, in the labor market. So as, uh, as on the demand side of a transaction, you have employers. And on the supply side, you have uh, rural unemployed youth um, or underemployed youth. Then if you grow the, the demand side of that transaction, you create more and better jobs or, or increase salaries uh, and wages through that. And the final one is um, enabling youth or enabling a particular group of disadvantaged people to take jobs that already exist. So, so reducing transaction costs and removing barriers um, in the labor market. So those three systems really explain how people derive a living and, and get work um, in rural areas. And I think those, it's important to look at that and, and say these systems existed before COVID and they will exist after COVID. And so introducing COVID brings in that kind of temporal dimension to those systems. Um, perhaps unlike some other crises, you know, a tsunami, earthquake, whatever, there is very much a during period. You know, we have before these systems existed, um, you know, they might have been dysfunctional, but the systems existed and they will exist after, whenever we get to after, um, sooner the better. Um, but but there is also a during, um, and the systems look different at every point along that that kind of temporal um, sort of timeline. And so you have in the middle you have opportunities um, caused by COVID uh, that that we can respond to. Um, but but it's important to note that they are temporary, and these systems are, are constantly shifting. So I mean. It was disappointing. We, we have pivoted a lot of our implementation programs to, to try to be more relevant to the types of impact we're trying to achieve um, in the context of COVID. But it was disappointing how much resource went into things that are already irrelevant, you know, <laughs> like trying to pivot so many manufacturers in Africa towards producing PPE when you can very quickly scale one in, in, in China or something that is now delivering to the world. I mean, that's not a that's not over yet, but I think certainly it has been overemphasized as a solution to create jobs uh, locally. So the systems exist before, those three systems in particular. Um, COVID is a shock to those systems, and there will be an after. And the role of digital in those is to acknowledge that digital is a facilitator of those, um, those functions. It, it's not an end in itself. You know, digitization is not inherently a good thing. It's only a good thing to the extent that it helps deliver those outcomes. Um, so um, when we're looking at the role that digital can play in the future and, and what has changed because of COVID, it's certainly the case that um, new markets are opening up to people and, and they could be a, a kind of area for intervention as, as people seek uh, maybe domestic markets rather than international markets for their produce. Um, and that can really be a way to, to grow that supply base and the own account production side. Um, it can also be an opportunity um, to, to focus more regionally. I think a lot of like job, your job matching platforms, for example, that you mentioned, um, they tend to operate fairly well on a national basis, or that's, that's the, you know, the, the leading area in that, but in rural areas, they're not really happening, despite the fact that that labor is still needed. Um, so there's an opportunity there. Um, so I think what I'm saying really here is is just to a bit of a reality check sometimes in, in our uh, response is that these outcomes that we're seeking to alter in work um, are the product of systems which existed before COVID and will exist after COVID. And so what we can do in our work um, is to maintain that systems perspective and know that if we are to deliver these outcomes in a sustainable way, um, we have to uh, be aware that we have to change the way that those outcomes are produced by altering the, the functions. And that is not you know, a particular digital solution, a particular firm delivering a particular thing. It is looking at the whole and seeing uh, how do people you know, get the goods and services that they need? How do they find out about job opportunities that exist? 
and there may be digital solutions to that uh, and there are certain efficiencies that can be gained in in doing so um, but you can also disrupt systems by by doing that and and kind of you know you can up, make a parallel channel um, so yeah i think maintaining that systems perspective when we develop interventions and also maintaining the sort of uh, the, the wider view on on the um, the temporary nature of some of the changes to these systems that have happened as a result of COVID. Yeah. And thinking about how our interventions are planned along that timeline and and how relevant they're going to be into the future. Um, so those would be the two points that I think we can do differently if we adopt a systems uh, perspective to to be more effective in our intervention. Thanks, Ben. That's really helpful. That's exactly the sort of guidance. As difficult and as, a, as quite a big challenge as it is, that's exactly what we were looking for from your point of view. Now we're going to move into the Q&A section of our discussion, and we're really looking forward to bringing the, the questions and the comments that have come from participants and bringing them to the panelists. So, Lisa, over to you for the first one to get us started. Thank you, Jamie. So what we're going to do is, is call our, our uh, first panel back into action. Um, and we have a, a quick question for the three of you, Nate and Jenny and Chandra. Um, you know, given where you're sitting right now, looking at, at using digital channels, digital solutions, uh, working with smallholder farmers and, and uh, you know, employment across uh, rural supply chains, what would you say is the major call to action uh, that we should all keep in mind right now uh, as we as we work through the challenges and the opportunities of this coming season. Well, maybe I'll start with, uh, I'll go backwards. Uh, how about, or in the middle, Nate, how, how about you? Why don't you go first? Sure. Um, and that's, that's a great question and uh, one I've been thinking about a lot. So I think that the, it's risky to develop and market test these sort of mis risk mitigation structures like platforms with you know the financial and non non financial services, especially when they have you know uh, the aspect of minimal barriers to entry, because they ultimately depend on low cost scale to sustain themselves, um, which means that you need to reach a lot of people very quickly. But the nice thing is that you know if there is one nice thing of COVID, is that it's providing um, an opportunity that we're seeing increased willingness to both seek and adopt these type of platforms. And so I think the call to action is that the development community needs to continue driving the learning about how we can, I'm, I'm gonna say behavioral because I'm from Basar, but the optimization of these platforms. I think we're doing it increasingly well, increasingly quickly, and we know that it doesn't just help the immediate farmers on the platform. It creates a more relevant, you know, dynamic view of the market, which ultimately, you know, increases stability, increases inclusivity, and, you know, the, the end state is that we have a better environment for labor to make optimal allocation and or investment decisions. So it, it kind of benefits everyone in the end if we can do this well. Thanks, Nate. And Jenny, what would your insight be here on a call to action given where we are this season? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'd like to see innovative public-private partnerships that can address the challenge of future markets and give farmers and value chain players some degree of stability. We've talked about reducing uncertainty, de-risking, and information is an important piece. That's the easy one to crack. It's how we can try and provide, yeah, some some security around um, pricing. Um, so that would be my challenge to put out there. Thank you, and and Chandra. So lastly, uh, I just want to mention uh, with regards to how uh, digital technology uh, can change the life of the world, right? We have seen how uh, digital is playing major roles for uh, youth employment, your know, women empowerment, and also changing life of the farmers. I, I genuinely believe uh, this I, ICT technology or IoT technology is not for your developed uh, world only. Uh, it's also for your developing economies, uh, like how amazingly your NGOs and the government uh, up and partnering also building our policies uh, with regards to how digital technologies can change the life of the farmers. If, if, if these things continue to do, uh, I think technology can play a major role in the environment where we live in, uh, not only changing life of the farmers, uh, but also enabling youth, women, and also the other other equalities in, in this environment. So that's, that's about me.
Great. Um, and, you know, just just my own two, two cents on this as we're working in Agrofin in the market is, you know, we're, we're as, as Nate said, uh, you know, a, a lot of information is flowing. A lot of farmers are looking for investment. I think, uh, you know, what we see now is it's time for financial institutions to start stepping back in um, and, and get the liquidity flowing. Uh, you know, the, the uh, farmers are, are saying that inputs are, are the real constraint. Input providers are saying they don't have the liquidity. So, you know, I think we have a moment now over the next three to four months uh, where it's time for the banks who've been watching from the sideline to <laughs> jump back in. That's my call to action. But I'll turn it over to, uh, to Jamie for the next round of, of questions. Thanks, Lisa. And I, I really like that question. And I'd like to hear Mikhail's response on that. What's your what's your sort of one line? Who should be doing what? What's your call to action, Mikhail? Just sum sum up in one line. But I, I want to go back to the point <laughs> I was making about these agri <laughs> Yeah. I want to go back to this point I was making about these agribusinesses. You know, they they a lot of them, these are private businesses. Uh they are generating income. Uh and most of their operations they can kind of fund through their through their business. But there are these these things that I talked about where they need additional support, like digitizing and, 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 or you know, professionalizing their staff or implementing better systems so they can scale. And I think this is really where you know, grant funding or impact investing funding can come in and play sort of a crucial role in helping them bridge those gaps, uh, which will then allow them to scale and, and, and expand their business and serve more farmers and create you know, a, a sort of like a ecosystem where other businesses can start up and, and sort of plug into the value chain. So that would be my call to action to to funders and impact investors. This is this is the time to to step in and invest more, not the time to pull out uh, this type kind of sort of vital funding. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Really important. Um, we have another question that that came to the chat that we want to pose. Again, just looking at the clock, time is a bit short, so we're going to ask you for just a, this is the lightning round, so just a quick one-sentence answer from each of you. We had a question come from our colleague, Zanu Agarwal, from 60 Decibels. As you may have seen in the chat, they're speaking to 500 farmers every month until December, updating the dashboard. They want their insights to be useful, of course. So the question, the challenge that she's posing is, what kind of farmer information do you want? What would you find really helpful given what they're already doing to be collected? So let's get a quick response from May Stewart, and then we'll circle back to Christabel. May? May, I think you might be on mute unless I'm getting cut off again. There you go. Can you hear me now? Okay, so yeah, what kind of information, this is really a, a generous offer. And for us, the information that we're really craving is that what kind of services are farmers having access to beyond production related services in terms of business development, marketing support and the like, and who are the service providers available to them that can help them overcome the challenges and the disruptions created by the current pandemic beyond public sector that is really crucial but also producer organizations input suppliers market actors what kind of service providers exist in their locations and uh, how can those be uh, empowered and improved to improve their access to services they need Great, thanks, Nate. Stuart? Um, I think everything May said. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> short answer, everything you can get, uh, but one area is just, you know, what crops have been planted in the ground. I mean, that ladders up to the food balance sheet work that the Kenyan government's doing and others. So I think that's an important one, but then also the inputs, uh, you know, what inputs do they have or not have access to? would be important, but uh, that's in addition to what May was suggesting. Excellent. And then coming back to you, Christabel. Uh, thanks, Jamie. I think two things come to mind. One is related to what um, May was saying, but primarily I would love to understand, I think we've always known which parts of the agricultural value chains are broken, but now that uh, sort of COVID uh, has disrupted that further and locusts has also disrupted that, 
I'm just curious to understand how agricultural value chains are actually changing. I think I've had a range of responses from we can't access inputs to other farmers, for example, on reform platforms saying, actually, we haven't really been affected because, for example, in Kenya, the lockdown primarily affected Nairobi and didn't necessarily affect rural areas. So it would be great to just get a sense of how agricultural value chains are being disrupted and what services can and can't be accessed at the moment. And then the second thought that comes to mind is, I think, primarily, a lot of how, I guess, farming was working was smallholder farmers would produce and then food would be transported to markets that then either to urban and peri-urban markets. But I'm just curious now that a lot of the transportation and logistics has been disrupted, whether there is an opportunity to imagine how smallholder farmers can start getting into value addition and whether that can then allow them to capture more value in the agricultural value chain. So two questions. One is how value chains are being disrupted and what experiences farmers are really having. And then two, whether there's an opportunity to rethink the role of smallholder farmers in agriculture and move beyond production to actually value addition um, given logistics have been disrupted at the moment and whether they can actually then serve the local markets that are around them by moving into production. Excellent, really, really helpful. And Ben, I have about 50 more questions for you, but systems analysis does not lend itself to the sort of concise one word answers of, of our other colleagues and expertise. So we'll, we'll put a pin in that and we'll come back to that on another occasion. We're going to move toward wrapping up. We're coming towards the end of our time. You may have noticed that in the chat box, we dropped the, the link to the survey to give us a bit of feedback, some suggestions, other things that you might like to hear about. We'd love to have your, your feedback. Um, for my part, before I pass over to Lisa, just uh, I wanted to say just thank you to everyone who joined the webinar, who contributed to the conversation. Special thank you to all the panelists everyone who dialed in, and then, of course, our teams, the CGAP and the AgriFin Accelerate teams who organized this and pulled it together. So, Lisa, over to you for the next steps and the last word. Thank you very much, Jamie, and uh, really appreciate all of the insights from this rich uh, group of experts. Um, and definitely, you know, from our perspective, you know, we look at technology as, as an enabler and an accelerator, but, you know, we respond to the, to the fact that, that uh, you know, the technology also can be leading us in directions that are non-inclusive as we think about women and we think about youth. Um, I, I completely agree with what Stuart said, that we, we have to um, challenge ourselves uh, to be farmer-centric, client-centric. Uh, certainly our experience is that solutions that we've built specifically for women do reach women. So this, you know, systems that we've built, solutions that we've, that we've helped our partners build for youth do reach youth. So I think that uh, you know one of our big takeaways in this and this, facing these huge challenges is that we have to be incredibly intentional um, about what we uh, you know what we're contributing here. Um, and I think that in this digital world, uh, we're getting so much data. I think uh, you know to Nate's point earlier, uh, it, it's raining data. You know the great work that that uh, Venue and and uh, 60 Decibels are doing, uh, that IDEO.org is doing. We're getting a lot of information. We're interacting. I mean, Mercy, Mercy Corps AgriFin program is is has touch points now on 20 million farmers. So we're talking to them. The channels are open. Um, I think it's it's an incredible opportunity we have now uh, to work across platforms uh, to share information. Uh, we've talked with a lot of commercial banks that say this is it. This is this is going to break. This is a breakthrough moment for us. We can't send loan officers in the field anymore. We have to rely on data. Uh, we've got to rely on information, the kind of, of, of great uh, information that you're seeing flowing through systems like, like crop in uh, systems like uh, true trade. You know, it's a moment when uh, instead of worrying about that blocked road, we can, we can start talking to farmers directly. We can start leveraging the data that we have to them to reach them. We can craft solutions uh, that meet their needs and, and can be very, very diverse. Uh, but I, I think I, I really uh, appreciate uh, the comments um, by May and by Mikhail um, and definitely by Ben. Um, you know, this is a we're we're going to need and by Stuart. Uh, you know, this is a this is a system uh, that we need to be approaching. It's not all about smallholder farmers. It's about all of the jobs uh, in in agriculture that can help us feed this continent. 
uh, moving forward. So, I, you know, I, I appreciate the, the CGAP lens on this. This isn't just about making things better for individual smallholder farmers. It's about using everything that we've got here to take food systems to the next, put, next step. Um, and to think about a very, very broad range of jobs and what's next for uh, what's next for labor. Uh, and we appreciate all of these inputs. So um, please do see our survey, I mean our study, uh, our study about uh, rural jobs. And, and I know Raffle also has some amazing work out on this that we encourage you to see. And as Jamie said, we've got a quick survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts, just a couple of questions, uh, you know, about how we can, um, you know, direct inquiry for, uh, forward. And uh, thank you guys so much for your time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to our panel of great experts. And we look forward to uh, taking this forward with the community. Thanks, everyone. Over and out from AgriFan. Thank you.